Amanda Zeffman from uh, Cambridge, the myth in Europe, uh, and not only in Europe, in the States too, Cambridge is all over. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about Cambridge um, model for technology transfer, which of course is just one example of a successful office in the UK. Now, just to clarify, Cambridge Enterprise is actually the technology transfer arm of the university, because it may not be obvious from the name. And it was incorporated in 2006 as a limited liability, wholly owned subsidiary of the university. And this was mainly for um, transparency in trading purposes, and also to ring fence some of the university's IP. Now, just to explain a little bit about um, who I am, so, as Lucas said, I'm Amanda Zeffman, and I'm Deputy Head of Consultancy Services at Cambridge Enterprise. And I'll talk a little bit about Consultancy Services later. So, as I've mentioned, I'm going to talk about the Cambridge model. But I also want to discuss um, how we could perhaps work with those of you who may be interested in a programme that we run um, to assist governmental and academic institutions overseas in development of knowledge transfer systems and also improvement of commercialization from research. Now, before I um, move on to talk about the Cambridge model specifically, I think it's really important to provide you with some background on the UK landscape as a whole in terms of funding for research and also funding for innovation, but also to provide you with some metrics um, for the UK as a whole. So how is research funded at universities in the UK? Well, firstly, universities are almost all publicly funded, and as you can see from here, almost half of the research funding, which is estimated to be about six billion, comes from <coughs> government funding bodies. So one, which is the Higher Education Funding Council of England, provides block grants um, for research. And then the UK Research Councils provide funding according to specific projects. Now, there are obviously other sources of funding too, but the one I want to draw your attention to is this HIF funding, which stands for Higher Education Innovation Funding. And it's basically ring-fenced money from the government, 150 million this year, to support innovation in um, universities. And actually, universities in the UK significantly rely on this to support their technology transfer operations. And I think it's also important because it highlights the government support and the government um, realisation of the importance of university innovation for the UK economy. So, the other important thing to add is that recently, impact from research, and of course commercialization is one way of facilitating impact, is really high on the government agenda. So much so that universities are required to submit data and statistics, both technology transfer outputs, but also research funding, which will then inform the level of research funding and also innovation funding in the future. So, for example, if a university is performing better, then it will be funded for innovation and research to a much higher level, which perhaps seems a little perverse. So, if we now move on to look at one of the UK government surveys that we have to supply data for, this looks at university interactions with business and also charities looks at potential um, outputs generated. And we can see here, the main, points that we, the main points I want to make are that 3.4 billion pounds was generated for the economy by universities carrying out these activities here, including, obviously, IP-related activities. And then if we actually focus on the IP activities, there was actually a 14% increase over one year, which is really, really positive. And although the number may look small when you sort of consider the overall research funding level, actually in terms of the size of the UK, 
it's, it's not bad at all. And you also have to remember that it's not just about the financial return. It's also about the overall impact to society, as Jane was saying earlier. So in terms of number of jobs created, products development, that will actually have benefit on society. If we actually look at the number of patent applications and patent granted, these have actually increased over the past few years. And although the actual numbers may be smaller than in the US and some other European countries, at least they're increased. So it's a very positive sign, and perhaps an indication that strategy may be changing in UK offices. Something we're very good at is forming spin-out companies. So we form about 200 a year, and in fact, there's about, I think, 1,200 actual active spin-out companies based on university IP, um, which reported to generate about 18,000 jobs and a turnover of 2.1 billion. So we're certainly contributing to the UK economy. So if I now just um, turn and focus on Cambridge, now hopefully all of you would have heard of Cambridge University, so I don't really want to say too much about the university itself, apart from the fact that it's very old, so it's 800 years old, and sometimes you think that the attitudes of some of the uh, academics is also 800 years old. Um, we're classed as number one in the UK, and also number three globally by the QS World Rankings. We're a very research-intensive university, as you might imagine, and a lot of that is actually fundamental research. And one of our main aims in carrying out research as a university with a charitable status is not only creation of new knowledge, but also dissemination and application. And of course, this is where commercialization can come into play. So who are we? Who, are, who is Cambridge Enterprise? Well, as our mission statement says down here, we exist to help our academics, where commercialization is appropriate, make their ideas and concepts more commercially successful for the benefit of society, for the economy, for the university, and also the researchers themselves. And you can see here, this is where we're located, in this building here that looks a little bit like a Lego construction, but I can ensure you that uh, it's certainly a lot sturdier and very orange inside. So we work according to seven key principles. You'll be glad to know I'm not going to talk through all of these at all. Um, but if we just focus on the top one, all I really want to say is that we only commercialize where the commercial channels are the most reasonable means to carry the idea forward. And then also to reflect on something um, someone said earlier, we're also very collaborative in our approach with our academics. So when we're commercializing, we make sure that we're involving the academic, that we've got their buy-in, um, which is absolutely essential. It also reflects the culture at Cambridge, which is very, very free. You cannot tell our academics what to do, because chances are they're going to do the opposite. <laughs> so before I move on to talk about how we set up operationally, I thought I'd take you through our IP policy and how it works. Now, in UK universities um, generally, universities adopt um, a university ownership model for IP. Now, in Cambridge, we have an extremely flexible model, and again, this is because of the culture of the academics, you, you know, the freedom um, requirement. You, again, you can't tell them what to do. So, just to talk you through this diagram, which really shows you the IP policy in practice, when an academic identifies that their research results may contain registrable IPR and if they want to commercialise, so see again the flexibility, they must disclose it to Cambridge Enterprise. And Cambridge Enterprise is acting obviously on behalf of the university. Now, the university actually has the initial right to apply for any registrable rights, although this is obviously funded, um, subject to third party funding. So once the academic has made the disclosure, Cambridge Enterprise, alongside the inventors, will obviously explore patentability and commercial application, check third party rights, and then together decide if they want to move forward. And if they do, then the IPR is, um, is assigned from the university and the inventors to Cambridge Enterprise. 
Now, I mentioned flexibility, so how does that actually come into play? So, the academics can actually choose to opt out of this policy. But, as I mentioned, all of this is subject to third-party funding requirements. So, assuming that there aren't any restrictions there, they can choose to commercialise themselves. Now, in practice, we'd strongly recommend against this. And actually, it doesn't happen very often at all, but at least our academics have that option. If they do decide to take it forward, and we're happy with that, then obviously the um, IPR is assigned from the university back to the inventor in order that they can take it forward and commercialise. But this is an exchange for the university taking a share in any future revenues. So how do we reward our academics? Well, as you can see here, we have an extremely generous revenue sharing policy. In fact, it's the most generous in the UK. And it's not until they reach the first £100,000 net income that the share drops to 60%. So really, the inventors are really in a very good position here, and it does seem to work as an incentive. Although there are many at the university who said, that if we did this again, we probably wouldn't make it so generous. If we now move on to looking at how we set up operationally, so as you can see here, we consist of oops, we consist of three overlapping functions, and I say overlapping because often our commercialisation strategy will involve all three um, activities. Now, last year we brought in about 16.6 million from all these activities and returned 15 million to the universities and the academics. So if we now look at each of these in turn, so technology transfer services, we have both a life science team and a physical science team, whose role, as I mentioned earlier, is to evaluate the technologies, to decide on patent strategy, and to draft and file with patent agents and counsel. And I think it's worth saying that we engage um, the patent agents almost from the outset because we believe it's essential to have a really good quality priority Patent. In terms of our overall strategy, we tend to file in the UK first, and then about 75% will enter into PCT, and then depending on outcomes of our discussions with potential commercial licensees, then we'll take it into nationals. And the rate from um, <coughs> priority to nationals is about 65%, so it's not too bad at all. So obviously the other role is identification and engagement with commercial partners and negotiation of commercial deals. And last year we executed about 104 licensed deals and we brought in an income of about 5 million. We also have a proof of concept and translational research fund and I'll talk about that a bit later in a case study. And in terms of the amount we invested, we invested 1.3 million in um, patents and proof of concept last year. So if we now move on to look at our seed funds. So our seed funds support startup um, of spin-out companies where university IP is involved or university academics, because if you remember we had this opt-in, opt-out policy. And how we support um, seed fund, uh, how we support startup company formation is in three separate ways. So we have various in-house funds that we can invest. We also have access to venture partners. We have access to mentors, so um, experienced business people both in the area and nationally. And we provide surgeries and support in terms of business, legal and financial information. Now last year actually was a record for our investment. So we invested about 2.3 million in 10 startup companies. We currently hold equity in 65 companies. And since 95, we've secured over a billion pounds in follow-on funding for our portfolio companies. So the picture is, is really positive. And here are some of our portfolio companies. I'm not going to go through them. You can find them all on our website if you want to find out a bit more about them. And then finally, if you look at consultancy. So consultancy, expert consultancy, 
is an excellent way of transferring knowledge from research from within universities to the wider community by applying existing skills, expertise, and know-how to solve specific problems. Now at Cambridge, academics can actually do as much consultancy as they like, there's no limit, which you may think would be a complete disaster. But actually in practice, because of the collegiate system, and they have so many different duties anyway, that if one of them started to neglect their actual employment, their research and their teaching, this wouldn't be looked on very well by their peers. So in practice, it really doesn't um, cause a problem at all. Now, they can come to our office to do consultancy. But they don't have to, but if they do, they can use our name. They can use the university's name, which is often what's required. They, can, they also get um, professional indemnity insurance. We negotiate all the contracts. Um, handle all the financial aspects and so on. And last year we executed about 250 agreements and brought in almost as much as the licensing income actually, so four and a half million, and we're um, forecast to bring in about six million this year. So it's really, you know, a really quite high share in terms of our overall income for our organisation. Now consultancy is also a great way of adding value to licensing. So, for example, we um, license some intensive care monitoring software to many organizations around the world. And the software creator also provides consultancy in many, you know, for many of these institutions. And, of course, that's adding value in terms of you know, providing his know-how. So I just wanted to highlight that as an example of how you, know, you can have several activities complementing each other. Also, we've had um, seed fund investments made, following on from the consultancy. And there are also other potential benefits from carrying out consultancy, such as obviously securing um, research collaboration funding, studentships, and also impact. Impact can be generated in fairly short time scales. So I just want to share with you one of our most recent really exciting successes, now this um, highlights really how as an office, from a single office, we can support technology development, technology transfer. Now this related to development of an anti-thrombotic antibody and also um, formation of a spin-out company called XO1. And the antibody has been hailed as the holy grail in um, anticoagulant uh, therapy because it has anti-thrombotic activity but it doesn't increase the risk of bleeding. So how we've helped with this um, technology development is that we, as if you remember, we have a translational fund. So we invested some money in the development of the synthetic antibody, which we then patented, sought licensees, attracted the interest of a company called Index Ventures, and then together with Index Ventures, made an initial investment. So if you remember, we have a seed fund, so we used some of that to invest in it to initially get it off the ground. We then secured a further 8 million euros. We obviously licensed the technology for um, an equity stake and a royalty stream. And now the technology is being developed aggressively. Hopefully, it will go into clinical trials within a year or two. So I'm not going to highlight some of these figures because I've mentioned a lot of them already. If you're interested, you can find all of these on our website. But I do want to mention um, the outreach program that I mentioned earlier. So obviously, just to remind you, this is a service that we offer to governments and academic institutions to help them develop their knowledge transfer systems and commercialization from research. Now, obviously, at Cambridge, we can draw on, obviously, the extensive experience and expertise, not only of staff at Cambridge Enterprise, but also of the university, the wider community, and obviously we have science parks as well. And it's a really, um, a really large and well-regarded technology cluster. And we can draw on any of these people to um, take part in the programme. So just to give you a flavour of the sort of countries and um, the projects that we've run. So we've worked with Kazakhstan, we've worked with Colombia, we've worked with Brazil, we've also done some work with China, Poland, 
Ecuador, Africa, to name, not including everybody, but those are just some of the examples. So just to give you an idea of the sort of things that we've done, so for Kazakhstan, we um, wrote a report providing recommendations on establishment of an ecosystem for creation, um, sharing, and also commercialization of knowledge. And I believe that a lot of these recommendations have now been put in place. In Colombia, we ran a couple of projects um, in regional areas. So one was for a university network, and one was for a government innovation network. And both of these spanned over several months. And we were mainly helping them evaluate their technology, develop their strategy for technology evaluation, also setting up companies, and helping them establish knowledge exchange networks. And they were so successful that we've since had several national projects. And then finally, this is um, the University of Campinas in Brazil. And this one I was directly um, involved in training. So here we basically um, helped them to establish their science park. So they came over to visit our science park and learn from our experience. And then we also sent people over, so I went over in September, to help train their technology transfer professionals in internal marketing with their academics and also interactions with industry. So those are just some examples of the type of projects that we've done. So just some key messages um, from the presentation overall. High level support is essential from government, from the institution, and from academics. Obviously from the government and institution, that's important to be able to get the appropriate level of funding required to um, commercialize. And academics, after all, they're the ones who are doing the research. So you know they need to be um, driven. Commercialization and impact takes time. So we, you know, we've had um, you know, technologies that we've started to develop that have taken 20 or 30 years before we've actually seen any impact. And I think you know, that's often the case. We can use several types of technology transfer and knowledge transfer together. So going back to my example of using consultancy to add value to licensing. And the UK is active in many mechanisms for technology transfer. So some offices perhaps focus on one or two approaches, others are more all-rounders. So for example, ourselves and somewhere like Imperial are, um, tend to be active in all the um, areas. And then generally the picture for the UK looks really promising. Levels of um, technology transfer and levels of knowledge exchange are constantly increasing. And you know, with the government support of innovation, and um, you know, the academics wanting to commercialise more, I think we're in a very good place. So thank you very much. <laughs>